Should we just? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Vaishnavi, it's all yours. Uh, Karuna Vaishnavi is head girl of the school. And Hello, she Vaishnavi. will do the, the honors. <laughs> Start. Good evening, everyone. The 26th of November is celebrated as Samvidhan Divas or Constitution Day. And we've often been taught how our constitution has much to be celebrated about and how it is there to protect the fundamental rights of the citizens. At the same time, health, water, daily nutrition and vaccinations for little children have been impacted by COVID this year. Given this scenario, we ask the important question. Is the Constitution of India a mere listing of rights? And who better than Ms. Karuna Nandi to speak to us about it? Ms. Nandi is a well-known advocate at the Supreme Court of India, an international human rights lawyer, and a pioneer in shaping much of the law around gender justice and freedom of speech. She has helped draft parts of the interim Constitution of Nepal, conducted workshops with the Senate of Pakistan on legislating constitutional rights, and worked with the government of Bhutan on the issue of compliance with their international treaties. It gives me tremendous pleasure to welcome you, ma'am. A very, very warm welcome from all of us at St. Mary's. Ms. Nandi's focus of work is in fact constitutional law, commercial litigation and arbitration, media law, and legal policy. She represents and acts as legal policy advisor to various governments, the United Nations, corporates, and civil society movements. After completing her graduation in economics at St. Stephen's, Ms. Nandi moved on to study law at Cambridge University, where she was awarded the Emmeline Pankhurst Prize, the Amy Cohen Award, and the Becker Studentship. She completed her LLM from Columbia University on a Columbia full-time fellowship. Ms. Nandi is one of the few lawyers who are still fighting to seek justice for the forgotten victims of the Bhopal gas tragedy. She was also a consultant to the Verma committee that was set up by the government to review India's anti-rape laws. The report was a precursor to the efforts that brought about the passing of the anti-rape bill. We are very glad to have you with us, ma'am. The mic is now yours. Thank you for that very kind introduction, Vaishnavi. Um, today is a big day. And the reason it's a big day is because it reminds us of Can I be seen and heard now? Yes, yes. Great. So the reason that today is a big day is because today is the day that uh, the Constitution of India was adopted. Um, now you may ask that why is it not just a official sort of, you know, one of these big official days that government celebrate? Why is it a big day for you and me? And I think the reason is, is that we forget sometimes, or rather, um, it's important for us to know in every fiber of our being that we come into this world as little wailing babies and we retain until we die particular rights. And these rights are basic to who we are as people. Now, these are called natural rights by some, by John Locke, for example. And these are rights that no government can give and that no government can take away. But on the 26th of November in 1950, what we did was that we gave ourselves these rights in more concrete fashion. And we gave ourselves these rights in a manner that would govern our relationship with governments, our relationships with each other and our relationships with companies. And these are not set in stone. I believe that the nature of our constitution is transformative so that the nitty gritties that are set out in the constitution must be, must hark back to 
its origins and must derive from its development since then. But as but but it should shape the constitution, the that's what's called the constitution. It should shape and help evolve who we are as a people, who we are as Indians, and Indians is what India is made up of. Um, land and you know, land is secondary. Um, now, what is this constitution that so many of us speak of? What is the greatest relevance to us as individuals? I believe that the fundamental rights section, it's chapter three of the constitution, is really the most significant for us um, as individuals. Let's start with the golden triangle of rights. The golden triangle of rights is Article 14, Article 19, and Article 21. Now, I really wish that, uh, see Vaishnavi nodding away, I really wish, wish that this was a uh, um, live uh, interaction where, where we could chat, because I'm sure many of you know some of these. But we'll, you know, I'm hoping we'll have a question and answer session later where you can ask me whatever you wish. So Article 14 speaks of the right to rule of law, which is that it's not just might is right, right? Like it's not just somebody with more power, whether it's a bigger person than us, whether it's an upper caste person, whether it's a man, whether it's, you know, somebody from a religion that has more power, whether it's a large company. They can't trample over us however, however they wish. <laughs> the rule of law is enshrined in Article 14. Now, the rule of law is not just that you can't just bring any law. You know, it's not just if you make a law that is deeply unequal and has a problem in that way, then it can be constitutionally examined for that. Because you can't, for example, discriminate between genders. You can't discriminate between... Uh, uh, religions, unless there is a, a reasonable classification that has, there's an intelligible differentia between the categories, and bear with me, I'll, ex I'll explain what that is, that you can tell what the difference is, and that that difference has relevance to the goal that is sought to be achieved, and that, that, that difference, the way you are treating that difference is not discriminatory, you're not treating one group over another. Um, the second, well, I could, ex how old is the youngest uh, uh, viewer? Sorry. I just this is actually uh, open to the whole school through YouTube. But okay. out here you have uh, what you call, I think class 11 would be um, 17, 16 and 17 years old. Otherwise you have adults. Okay. Would it be comfortable for me to speak of the law against sexual violence? Yes, of course. Uh, okay. is absolutely fine. So I'm leading the marital rape case in um, the Delhi High Court. Now this is the case at the moment rape by husbands uh, of wives is actually not criminal. And this comes from a sort of very old, sort of ancient Victorian um, sensibility that brought this into English law and then brought it here and then through here traveled to various jurisdictions. It's very interesting to see the geographical um, travel of this sensibility. Um, it was just really one, one man who wrote a textbook who, who dreamt up the doctrine. It's bizarre, right? One man who dreamt, dreamt up the doctrine that then brought it into English, that brought it here. Of course, in English law, this has been repealed in 1993. In many other parts of the world, this has been repealed. But in this country, it still exists. Now, this is important because the vast majority of sexual assault happens in the context of marriage. This is um, not my data. This is government data. Uh, national Family Health Survey data that shows that over 90% of sexual assault happens in the context of marriage. Now, of course, we have clients that we, uh, and you know, in our judicial, in my judicial trainings, um, I also workshop and I also see that judges do this going forward. 
use other provisions to bring such sexual assaults to justice. However, given the scope of the uh, Section 375 of the Indian Penal Code, um, where it says explicitly that if you are married, then that is exempt from the law of rape, that this is not um, included in <clears throat> the law of rape. This influences a lot of judicial proceedings. So we are arguing in court that you can't treat three categories, coming back to Article 14, that you can't treat the three categories of rape victims and rapists separately. The three categories being, if the person is married to a rapist, if the person does not know her rapist, and if the person is separated from a rapist. The separation aspect is something that we were able to bring in in the amendment to the rape laws in 2013 after the Nirbhaya uprising, um, just to add to the categories of women who were protected. So that equality argument is a very powerful argument. It's also one of the cases that we are citing there is um, the Anuj Garg case. And in the Anuj Garg case, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg's doctrine of sc strict scrutiny from the US constitution was brought in to the Indian um, examination by the Supreme Court, Indian examination, constitutional examination of laws, saying that where a legislation appears to be beneficial, in that case, they weren't allowing women to work in bars, women who had, uh, as bartenders. So for example, you could go to, uh, you know, a company like the Taj and train in the, um, in their service and culinary schools and train to become, you know, one of the things you have to do is, uh, one of the things you could train to do is uh, be a bartender and you could not then. Um, and they struck that aspect of the legislation down as discriminatory, even though it's seemed to protect women from alcohol and, you know, drunk men and that sort of thing. Article 21 speaks of freedom and it is the right to life. Our, the Constitution of India has had a very leading role in, and the Supreme Court in elaborating that, um, that role in specifying that the right to life is not just the right to habeas corpus. Habeas corpus means free the body, which means that if you are in jail without um, cause, without, you know, without any legal reason that you can go to court that somebody can go to court and ask for you to be brought out. Um, it's, it's the right to a good life. It's uh, the right to be free from the kind of pollution that we face today. There's a CNG judgment that was passed um, in another round of, um, at another time when we were facing the kind of smog that we do today and the Supreme Court stepped in and said that Article 21 is a right that is available to all of us and that we have a right to be free from this pollution. It's the right to environment. It is the right to be free from wanted labor. It is the right to be, it's the right to privacy. There's a huge, um, very important judgment, um, sort of the Puttaswami judgment. Um, it's a constitution bench which says that the right to privacy is the right to privacy of the body, the right to decision-making uh, of the body and the right to choice, the right to be able to do, for example, an internet search without Big Brother watching me, the right to have phone conversations without snooping, so the right to informational decision-making. So if I have everyone watching all the time, then if eyes are always upon me, the whole world is a prison. Article 19 is, has a variety of rights under it, but I think one of the most important is Article 19.1a, which is the right to free speech. And the right to free speech is not the right to free speech until you offend, as is popularly thought. Offense is part of the hurly-burly of free speech. The 
No, I'm not saying that, you know, you shouldn't be polite to your peers or your family. I'm saying that where should the state step in? Where should the government start legislating and saying that you cannot say this on pain of criminal penalty, for example, or you cannot say this on uh, pain of pay uh, payment of fine? The right to speech, free speech can only be limited under one of eight grounds. For example, um, disruption of public order, which is not one person hitting another, but something like causing a riot. Um, defamation. There are also broad, broader grounds like morality, etc. Now, the reason the right to free speech, I think, is very fundamental to the other provisions of the Constitution is because those are the pipes that keep everything else going. Without free speech, we would not know that a large number of farmers in this country have a problem with their livelihood at the moment. We would not know, government would not know, other citizens would not know that there are any problems in the polity that need to be addressed. So then how can they be addressed? Um, how do we participate in a democracy without the right to free speech? Democracy is not something that happens once every five years. It, it is a continuing process. And at its best, it's a continuing process of dialectic, of election, the government gets constituted, but the citizenry keeps sort of speaking up about what's going well and what's not going well. And government keeps responding and reconstituting itself and seeing how, and the citizenry then feeds back. And so it's a constant feedback loop at its best. The, um, I found the, the topic of today interesting. Is this just a listing of rights? Is the constitution just a listing of rights? Is this just something in the abstract? Well, the first thing, of course, is that all these rights are interrelated. Um, as I was speaking of the right to free speech, it feeds into the other, the other basic rights and into all the other rights, really. Um, and so equality and uh, freedom as well. But what does it mean to us today? The Oxford Hindi, um, I think it's the Oxford Hindi Dictionary, two days ago said that Samvidhan was the most important Hindi word of the year, because that is the word that found the greatest resonance. And today Samvidhan Divas, Samvidhan is a constitution. Um, the greatest resonance um, amongst Hindi speakers in the last year. As a constitutionalist, as somebody who works in the area, it was incredibly powerful for me personally to see thousands, and in some, place, hundreds, some, some places, hundreds of thousands of people read the preamble and know that it was our own. And the reason that the constitution is important is and the rights are not just on paper is because it allows us to be who we are, to be human beings, sentient human beings who have thoughts that are untrammeled by bullying or by, by law, by any law, thoughts should be untrammeled by any law. Speech that is free, that is only subject to the most reasonable restrictions. Freedom to wear what we like and to be able ideally to go for a walk in the middle of the night without thinking about it twice. The freedom to travel on public transport and go to work go to leisure destinations without a second thought. The freedom to breathe, the ability to breathe, the ability not to be discriminated against and the ability to flourish regardless of our genders, whether we are men or women or trans, 
regardless of our sexualities. For our sexualities and for our genders to be addressed and for equality to be achieved, keeping in mind our particular characteristics, our particular situations. The right to be able to, under Article 25 and 28, the right to be able to worship whoever we wish and to propagate our religions, or to not, to be atheists. The right to be citizens. In many ways, these times are dark, and it is important to remember that The arc of the moral universe is long, <clears throat> but it bends towards justice. And if we hold that light in our hearts, in our minds, as we persevere, we must remember that each act of freedom, each act of supporting and respecting another person's freedom and equality that we make is in furtherance of the great constitution of India. Shall we take questions? Yes, I think we'll take questions. Vaishnavi, you're going to moderate. Thank you very much, ma'am, for that lecture. I've personally learned a lot, and I really love how you defined um, the right to freedom as the right to simply a good life, which I completely believe is the motive of the constitution as a whole. And also, I will definitely be using the phrase intelligible differentia in my conversations now. <laughs> That'll make you popular. <laughs> and I do see a lot of people lined up to ask you questions, and I will go one by one. Um, the first question is from Dhruvisha Jaiswal of class 12. Dhruvisha, why don't you go ahead? Uh, you're muted. I'm so sorry. Good evening, ma'am. So my question is, basically, in one of your interviews, you gave a very interesting insight about what justice really is, as opposed to what justice means or is perceived. Would you elaborate upon that? I can't for the life of me remember what that was. Why don't you elaborate <laughs> upon it? <laughs> So in one of your interviews, you stated that you believe that what justice, uh, what justice is perceived as is how we feed into justice. No, I think uh, what, uh, what uh, was coming up at that time was that justice is perceived and what you actually get. So like, you know, you have been speaking just now about uh, you know right to freedom to be you know follow the religion that you want to be who you are now this is it may be a judgment that is given out or it may be in the constitution but as perceived by the common man we are not free to be what we are so sometimes even in school as a principal i think i have been just but the students don't perceive it as justice Mm. So there is a difference between perception and reality. And I think that's what you were talking about at that particular interview. Yeah. These children were talking. And I was just wondering about that. Okay. So, uh, so I don't, I, I can't remember the context of what I said then, but I think that there are multiple realities, um, that there isn't a single reality that, and it's very important to bring all those realities on board. Um, for example, somebody, you know, one person may have grown up in a reality thinking that women must um, take care of the home and must nurture and must only do that, right? And, uh, and another person may grow up in, the reality, in a reality saying that gender is not relevant to who you are and uh, not to who you are, but to, to what you do. Um, and what you, it shouldn't limit what you choose to do. So I think in that sense, that would influence one's idea of, in, in the same way, I think that would influence one's idea of justice. And in that regard, I think that representation is very important 
of uh, uh, at the court level, for example, having a variety of lived experiences on the court. Um, but in another sense, maybe in a smaller sense, um, but let's remember that the impact of a principal on a student is possibly greater than the impact of the Supreme Court on a citizen in some ways, you know? Um, I think the listening to the various realities and communication of any decision taking into account those realities, whether or not those are um, agreed with, I think is possibly really important because I analogize this from the from the court, for example, and and I think that you know one thing that is required by courts is that where arguments are made before the court that you have to address them. Like you have to say that, okay, so this was argued before me, this was argued before me, this was argued. And then here is why I agree with this and I don't. And that's where I think the role of reason comes in. Because ultimately what in the justification of reason is the greatest justification, I think, of the power of, of, of power, of any power, and particularly the power of courts. Um, and not just power because it exists, power because it is because it's there. In that regard, also there was um, there's a trend of restorative justice that has come up in the context of juvenile justice, which is that um, the Juvenile Justice Act in India is a legislation that follows the uh, the model juvenile justice law uh, of the United Nations as well as the Child Rights Convention. And it addresses children in conflict with the law, as well as children uh, who have been victims of neglect and um, of neglect. And one of the basic principles there, it's quite interesting, is restorative justice. So if a child goes and um, damages, say, say steals a piece of fruit, this seems strange to, to use an example like that, but we have examples where children have stolen something small, a really poor child has stolen something small and then has been in detention for many, many years, right? Um, so the idea there is to facilitate a conversation between the child and the shop owner with a supportive environment, ideally with um, the parents involved and the, the, you know, some maybe somebody from the school, whatever supportive environment the child has, um, in many cases, they won't have much of a supportive, supportive environment, as well as um, somebody either designated by the magistrate or the magistrate themselves. And what is explored is what is the idea of justice for the person who is, um, has been stolen from. And the person stolen from is, may feel that they want the child to apologize and to apologize very seriously. And, maybe if you know maybe give the value of the bread back or twice the value of the bread back um and from the child's perspective maybe it makes sense to make to make sure that the child does some kind of maybe community service to understand that they can't just take what they wish so I think perhaps what I was referring to was the idea of deep listening, the idea of reason, the place of reason, and addressing the actual idea, the feeling of vindication and the feeling of having received justice for the person who has been harmed and reformation and rehabilitation, the person who is accused of wrongdoing. Thank you, ma'am. Um, the next question is from Riday in class 12. Riday, go ahead. Um, my question is that uh, the right to constitutional remedies ensures that fundamental rights are not easily violated. But what could uh, the legal thought be behind the Chief Justice of India publicly discouraging people to stop filing petitions under the Article 32? 
Um, look, on the face of it, I don't think it's really a big problem. On the face of it, uh, the uh, Chief Justice Bobde saying that I want to limit the petitions under Article 32 would not be a problem because what Article 32 is, is a mechanism through which petitions are filed to directly to the Supreme Court. Now, the directly, remember the word directly, to agitate fundamental rights. Now, our Supreme Court has the widest jurisdiction of any court in the world. It also, because for example, under Article 136, you can go to the Supreme Court against any order of any court. So you could have an interim order from a magistrate's court and go directly to the Supreme Court and knock on their doors and say that, look, I'm challenging this. And the trouble is that it would be listed on a Monday or a Friday. And this is why I say it has a wider jurisdiction and the Supreme Court would decide whether they want to spend additional time on it. Nine times out of 10, they wouldn't. In more recent years, the Article 32 jurisdiction has been limited and not just by this Chief Justice, because the idea is that the high courts should decide their own, uh, should decide first. And then you have a first decision maker to refer to and your process becomes much easier, becomes quicker, and you're not going into the nitty gritties of a, a fresh decision, right? Because after all, this is the highest court. It's not the first court in most instances, it's the highest court. The reason that what Justice Bobde, the, the Chief Justice said was controversial was because I think that a lot of people were feeling that there must be a rigorous consistency in the, execu in the manner in which fundamental rights are discussed and decided. And the feeling was that in some cases, the Article 32 jurisdiction was being used and in some cases it wasn't. And I do believe that particularly in these times of polarization, that the doctrine of stare decisis, the doctrine of rigorously following precedent and consistency is absolutely vital because that is the thing that will bind different kinds of cases um, together under the same rules. Thank you, ma'am. Um, the next question is from Shagun of class 12. Good evening, ma'am. Uh, that's a great session there. Uh, so my question to you is that state governments uh, constantly seem to be putting up legislations uh, which uh, violate our rights. For example, the newly proposed uh, legislation, UP and MP on love jihad. So does this mean that our nation requires stronger special marriage acts and how would our constitution protect us? So uh, I think the Special Marriage Act also is not ideal because what it requires is posting that you're going to get married in a public place and then inviting objections. I mean, how ridiculous is that? Why should somebody else be able to object to your marriage, right? Um, and that aspect is being challenged constitutionally. The point you're making, Shagun, is important. Uh, the love jihad, the, the so-called love jihad bills, we haven't seen those uh, draft laws yet, but they've been proposed in five states. But also, you know, let's not forget that um, non-Sung governments, non-BJP governments have also in the past, also in the present, less, I think significantly less so, uh, violated constitutionality at the first instance. For example, the Kerala Police Act proposed amendment, 118, section 118D, which essentially so, seeks to criminalize any speech that is, among other things, humiliating, right? Not defining what humiliating is. Um, is completely unconstitutional. I argued one of the cases, you know, Shreya Singhal versus the Union of India with other counsel, which said that you can't have laws like that, that are so vague, that have a chilling effect, that, that sort of silence other speech that are overbroad, that because you don't know what the, what the law is supposed to prohibit and what it doesn't. So I think the point you're making is really important that governments have to act constitutionally at the first instance. 
And I think these, ideally, these really would be election issues, but they're not at the moment. Um, because courts have limited bandwidth, there are limited constitutional challenges in courts, um, and it also takes time. And I think until we see penalization by the courts, until strict penalization by the courts of these unconstitutional, although I don't see how that would happen because you can't really penalize parliament. So it would really have to become an election issue, I think. Um, but the culture of constitutionality therefore is vital. And the politicization in the sense of, you know, voting on these bases, I think is vital, including voting on equality and women's rights, which is something that is starting to happen in, in some way. Not, not as uh, widespread as I would wish, but it's starting to happen. Thank you, ma'am. Um, I think Gracie now from class 12 has a question on, on the same lines. So Gracie, why don't you go ahead? Hello, ma'am. Um, Hello. Now I wanted to ask you, every time a new government is elected, um, they interpret and manipulate the laws according to their own philosophies. So how can that be resolved or what could be the ideal solution for it? Look, in principle, that would be all right, Gracie, because uh, the idea is that you elect a particular government and then they make the laws reflecting the ideas of the citizenry that elected them. The thing is that they have to be within the bounds of constitutionality, that you can't legislate inequality. You can't make inequality law. Like for example, the, the idea of the proposed love jihad laws. And that feeds into Shagun's question, I think, Gracie, which is that, um, that the bounds of constitutionality have to be respected by every government that comes in. And within those bounds, um, the governments can do what they wish, right? But also there is the, this is where the constitutional right to protest comes in, because if there is something that is um, constitutional, but a problem in other ways, then protests may happen, writing may happen, debate may happen. And ideally as a result, the government would listen and deeply consider whether it should change what they're doing or not. So for example, with the Kerala Police Act amendment, the section 118D that I just spoke of, they have suspended its operation. So that's a good thing. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. I think we have uh, some time for a few more questions. So um, I'll ask Sanya to ask the question now, Sanya. Good evening, ma'am. Uh, my question Good is the, con the constitution, it basically upholds the equality of all religions, but the recent uh, amendment of the NRC, it basically uh, discriminates against individuals on the basis of the religion that they follow. So to what extent do you think is it justified, especially in a secular country like ours? Not the NRC. This, the NRC is something that is, um, you know, something that is feared to come in in the future. The CAA the, is... Can you tell me what the CAA is? Not to put you on the spot, but do you know what it is? Basically, it talks, uh, it particularly it's gives the title. Amendment Act, yeah. Yes, ma'am. Uh, it particularly gives the title. It is basically formed uh, to remove illegal immigrants from our country, which is definitely a threat to the resources of our country. But at the same time, it, uh, according to my opinion, this particular bill is targeting a particular religion, uh, we have Muslims for that matter, so which is incorrect in my opinion. So not quite. Uh, what, what the CAA does is that it only allows immigration from particular countries. Um, and it only allows immigration of particular religions from those countries, right? So they don't, for example, look at the fact that Rohingyas are discriminated against in Myanmar or Ahmadiyas in Pakistan. Um, and so that, so th there's a problem there because then suddenly in the idea of citizenship, which in India, there should not be any distinction on the basis of 
uh, religion in the idea of citizenship, right? Um, they have brought in religion. So I think that's the, a big problem there. Another problem is the rules that were brought in under the Citizenship uh, uh, Act uh, in 2003, which basically said that the particular types of data that can be gathered and the, the National Population Register, the NPR, is something that, um, and the census, they were starting to gather particular types of data that people fear will lead to a full-scale NRC. And the reason we are concerned about NRC is because of the way in which it has been executed in Assam. And um, illegal, you know, so-called illegal immigrants, and we don't know whether it's true or not, because the process by which it happened was really bad. So like a lot of papers weren't properly considered, it was really sloppy, and you know, people's freedom was decided on that basis, right? Also, even if one is found to be a Bangladeshi illegal immigrant, if Bangladesh is not accepting those illegal immigrants, then where do you go? Like, are you supposed to be in detention forever? So, um, so there are huge and very basic problems with, um, with those provisions. And that is why there was a huge fight against them. And I hope that it continues in some shape or form. It will, you know, there, there are petitions before the court. Of course, they haven't been heard yet. Um, Protest is practically impossible in this COVID environment, but I hope that uh, those protests continue. You know, when you talk, um, uh, Karuna, there's such a sense of, you know, rationality around everything, but there's such a, I mean, as a, as a citizen or as a common person, you know, one mostly gets a feeling that there is, great irrationality going on everywhere you know so i mean i i don't know how that is waved and that's what i was thinking when you talked about justice perceived it may be perceived that justice has been done that um, you know arnab was listened to while others are not listened to and 32 is sent back to the high court but it's i mean while there may be a reason and it's, you know, it's logical that everybody should go to the high court and not come to the Supreme Court. Then one but then everybody should go, you're right. Yeah. That is, if, if one person goes, then everybody should go. Unless, unless there is a very compelling reason for that person to not go, you know? Like yeah. you always have to have that. But, but, but then as you quite rightly said, that that reason has to be there. Why this person and not the other person? But I think that, you know, it's important to remember uh, that the Supreme Court is a polyvocal court. So there are lots of different benches. The, you may have one bench that is all for civil liberty and had Sudha Bharadwaj's cases come before the same bench that decided Ornob's case would have decided it the same way. But the Sudha Bharadwaj's case went to a different bench. So there we then have a root and branch examination of the entire system. And that should the, that predictability that I was speaking of, you know, that should the cases not be allocated in an exceedingly predictable manner, rather than the chief justice being the master of the roster and the yeah. case is being allocated in a way that we don't know what the basis is. Like the activist who needed a, a straw, you know, I mean, yes. and, you know, that's not being heard and then it's left. And then talking about that, and I believe in the American courts, uh, today I was reading that in face of Ruth, the new um, chief justice that has come in, you know, they had said that religious places should be shut down during the COVID. But now that ruling has been overturned by five to four. And so religious places can open up, you know. And so, I mean, um, uh, like it's a, a, a judgment can just, you know, change everything that is there. For instance, um, while you may say that, you know, uh, festivals should not be celebrated, but the Mahakum is going to be held, I believe, um, in UP next month, you know. 
And um, so uh, those, and uh, also I think there was a question I've seen Vaishnavi about, they had asked about the Sabri Malai case and women going to Sabri Malai. And, uh, you know, so this popular, um, uh, the popular judgment, you know, the, or the the judgment that deals with the with the larger uh, population, uh, and then influences. So the judges are not supposed to be influenced, but are they influenced by what popular sentiment would be? And do um, they interpret the law accordingly? You know, because it's all about interpretation, isn't it? Look, I think that. Judges are human and where discretion comes in, lived experience comes in and where, you know, the way I played Gulli Danda as a child or cricket or whatever it was um, and what I read in the newspaper and the news that I get may sort of creep into my subconscious. But at the same time, let's remember that all judges particularly constitutional judges, are trained to have a distance between um, the facts that come out of evidence, the ideas that they must consider, and the ideas that they must not consider. So how do we make sure that we, we get the consistency that we deserve? Again, it, always, it comes down always to consistency, you know? So how do we make sure that we get the consistency we deserve? And how, how do we make sure that we get the representation we deserved? I, I think that having a diverse court, having a diverse set of courts where lived experience counts, where you have many different genders, many different religions, many different castes on the bench is vital. That, um, that also predictability in all these different ways uh, that, that I've been speaking of, whether it's stare decisis, whether it's following the doctrine of precedent, whether it is following a very predictable manner in allocate, of allocating cases, I think is absolutely vital. Um, but also, I will say that in the Sabri Malai case, Although I am, you know, clearly somebody who believes that everyone should be able to go and worship whoever they like, um, there is Indu, Justice Indu Malhotra's judgment in that case, for example, right? Um, it's a perfectly reasonable judgment. The idea is that the state can regulate religion but only to an extent that there are things that you have to leave to religion i completely personally disagree with that i agree with the chandrachur and nariman way of thinking about this which is that religion can do whatever it likes as long as it is within the bounds of fundamental rights if you are discriminating on the basis of religion between menstruating and non-menstruating women or between women and men you can't do that um but it's not that Justice Malhotra's judgment was not reasonable. So I also think that when we are, you know, in these very polarized environments, um, sloganeering is more common than rational thought. It's really important to this sun fact. And I think that students, particularly for you, this is a fundamental skill to develop now. Like if you're 17, really now is the time. That you're able to look at your phone and say, this WhatsApp forward, there's something in it that's going to make me check to credible sources that I'm someone who doesn't say I found this on Google because Google is like saying, it's like saying I found it in a book. I mean, the book could be nonsense and the book could be um, peer reviewed by, by five internationally recognized reviewers, right? There's a difference. Um, and so to be able to look at a piece of news 
and to be able to critically think about, is this true or not? Is this factual or not? I think is really important. It's more interesting to hear someone give a polemic speech. It's full of passion and fire and brimstone. Um, but getting to the bottom of what is actually going on in our country and in our lives. And most importantly, having the ability to get to the bottom of what's actually going on, I think today is vital. And that, that includes reading the abstract of a judgment, you know, so be it. They're not actually that complicated. Some of them are, are too long, but some of them are short and um, live law and bar and bench are a good place to read articles about these judgments. Okay, um, it's 5-3. I see uh, uh, Karuna has another. Uh, you want to take one last question? Uh, is, uh, would you like the teachers? Any of the teachers want to ask because we've allowed students? You can uh, take a last question, Vaishnavi. Teachers, any teachers uh, wanting to ask something? Not at all. So then we give it to a student. Uh, Veshmi, is there one more question from a student? Yes, ma'am. Sarah wants to ask a question. Sarah from class 11. Good evening, ma'am. Uh, so my question is that we have been seeing a tremendous increase in incarceration of people who have spoken up against the government, either through their work, their social media accounts, or through peaceful protests. So to what length is this detention constitutional? Well, I think some of it isn't constitutional at all. Um, I think some of the laws under which some of these people, some of these people have been detained uh, um, are not in fact constitutional. Uh, some of those laws have been tested and have been um, found to be constitutional. Um, so my opinion in this doesn't matter that much because if the courts have found that it's constitutional, there's uh, sometimes that's, the, you know, if it goes up to the Supreme Court, then that, that ends up being the last judgment. Um, but we also have to go down to the level of the particular law and say, even within that law, is it legal or not, right? Um, the thing about laws like the UAPA, the anti-terror laws, is that they brush aside many of the civil liberties that are enshrined in the CRPC, in the Criminal Procedure Code. And that allow, that, that scare judges off into sort of allowing custody for long periods that um, allow the reversal of the burden of proof in some cases and um, perpetuate incarceration where it was illegal in the first place. So I think that there has to be a ongoing challenge to these laws and how they are framed. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much, ma'am, for answering all those questions so patiently. Um, yes. Can I please request um, Eshwarya to give the vote of thanks now? Thank you so much, Ms. Nandi, for making time to be with us today. We were told that you're coming from another session and going to a third so a truly heartfelt thanks from all of us. The session was indeed very insightful and we are glad we got an opportunity to recollect the various laws laid down in our constitution. I think I speak for everyone in the audience when I say that this talk has given us a fresh perspective to analyze and understand the world we are living in today. I would also like to thank all who joined us online for this event. Have a very good evening, thank you. Thank you and Jay. Thanks so much, Karuna, for coming. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, ma'am.